Okay. Now, let's see. Uh, so, this is the original diagram. I am redrawing it. And the diagram says, well, these are the projection maps, the product projection maps. If I have something over here, if I have like this, then there is only one way in which I can come down like this, right? That's what 50 is about. And that one is F cross G. Do you, uh, do you have any questions on this uh, Charles or anyone else? This is the unique way. So you can think of it in this way. You can complete this from A cross C to B cross D. You can go in only one way. And that one way given by the function is f cross g. And f cross g is turns out to be defined like this. On the pair, on a pair, on an ordered pair, so it should be on an ordered pair like this, it gives me this ordered pair. Are the things clear from here? Uh, up to this, any questions? Not clear, any questions? No, no question yet. Okay. Now, what you did, Charles, was, is it this, if I understood it right? You wanted to, you wanted to do 51, right? So that's why you are speaking about one identities of A and C, right? No, it was number 50. Ah, so number 50, what is the problem then? Uh, I wasn't so sure whether what I was doing was correct, especially on those identities, on the diagram itself. Okay. Can you help me with the diagram on that one? How does, the, how does this diagram come? Okay. Uh, sorry, doctor. Yes. I think he's asking um, how do we actually um, insert the identity onto this particular diagram that we've got in front of us, the 50. Identity on A? Uh, the identity of A cross C, which is in fact 51. Yes, which is in fact 51. Yes. So that's what I'm asking. Charles? Yeah, I can hear you, Doc. Uh, it looks like I, I, I don't know whether my notes are a bit different. Because I see on 50, there, there is uh, one subscript A times C is equal to 1A times one subscript C. Ah, I see. Yes, it is a di different. Yes. yes I, I think it's an identity function. Then. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Correct, correct. Yeah, in, the, in the new version of the... Time. In the new version of the notes, they were... They became uh, uh, equation 51. Okay, yes. So now, yes, that's what I, I, I also guessed that you, you are trying to do that. So, you wanted to show, therefore, this one. Okay? Yeah, that's correct, Doc. Now, let's, let's change this diagram a little bit. Let's make this... A. 
let's make this C and let's make this A cross C. And this one, let us make this one identity of A and identity of C. Just by looking into the diagram, can you fill in this place? Ah, obviously, this is P A. Ah. Obviously, this is P A and this is P C. Can you fill in this place from A cross C to A cross C? Yes, we can. Yes, you are right. We can fill in by this by taking this to be just, we are just filling it first. Okay. Now let us see. See the, now let us see. Does this happen? Now what is 1 of A cross C? Well, we know from its definition this is, what is this? This is going to A. Right? That's the definition of that function. Yes. So now let us see. Now let us compose. So what is P A composed 1 of A cross C? So if I do it, well, this is, what is it doing? So I am trying to mimic the diagram. This is coming to A cross C. Again, this is 1A cross 1C. I am drawing this. Now, if I take the projection, it will be A. And on A cross C, obviously, if I take the projection, it is A. And this is the identity. And similarly, the other side. So, I can see that this is obviously nothing else but identity of A composed P A and same similarly P C is identity of C composed P C. So, I have obtained one function. Remember, the whole idea over here was f cross g is the unique function such that there is a such, there is a clause. There is a clause which says pb composed f cross g is f composed pa and pd composed f cross g is equal to g composed pb. So, the, it says that there is one and only one function which satisfies these two equations. Now, I have found out one function in this case which satisfies these two equations. So, therefore, I can immediately conclude that 1a cross 1c, which is, which is the denotation over here, is nothing else but the function 1 of a cross c. See, I do not need to look into this formula even. I do not need to look into this formula for the function. What I did was, I just checked if I can fill this place, which satisfies, which makes both these squares commutative. If I can do that, then that is that unique function required. And I did it over here with one identity of A cross C. And therefore, it must be, as, it, as we established in general, so therefore it must be 1 of A cross 1 of C. Is it clear? Is it here now? Yes, it is. So, you see, you could have, you could have gone in from here to
to say, well, this is nothing else but 1 of A of A and 1 of C of C and hence this is 1 of A cross 1 of C of AC and so therefore you could have done that also. Uh, there would have been no problem. But you see the difference between these two uh, approaches. Here in the first one I didn't bother about the exact formula, exact formulation of this function f cross g. I only took records to the property. What is the property? That whenever I have such a piece, then I there is f cross g, that is, there is only one and only one function which makes this whole diagram commute, which means that function satisfies these two equations. And I found out, by some hook or crook, I found out one function. It is there. And it satisfies these two. So therefore, it must be this. You see the logic? The other one was obviously very, very, uh, this one is very, very computational. You computed this in this way, using this formula, and said, well, 1a cross 1c has this, and 1 of a cross c have the same domain, codomain, and the formula. Therefore, these two functions are same. So, that's also correct. But, uh, uh, for myself, I would like the latter, because you have established this already. This result has already been established. And you are using it to prove the next one. So it is much simpler. If you have taken pains to establish 50, why equation 50, why redo it again? Why reinvent the wheel again and again? Uh, you can do it at the same time. You see, I am in that flow, so I am just saying it. I will just quickly say it. I know possibly everybody may not have done it. So I will just give a, a, a schematic diagram. It is very similar. Very, very similar. So this is about 52, the next equation. So you have the first one here. And you have another one here. Fifty tells you that you can complete this in only one way. Okay? Fifty also tells you that you can therefore complete it in only one way. I'm saying complete it, which makes this diagram to commute, the top two squares to commute. Okay? So that means this composed with this is this composed with this. This followed by this is this followed by this. And same here. Now let's see. On the two edges, this composed with this gives me this composite. Same over here. And you can compose this, these two middle vertical arrows. And if this one, now let us see, I am saying this would also compose, why? Suppose if you wanted to go by this route, from here, the pink one followed by this. Well, this obviously means this, this and this one. You can see my cursor moving, right? So, 
when I you can see how I am tracing it right uh, am I clear so this pink big yes, this pink big arrow followed by this this is nothing else but from commutativity because this pink one is the commu composite of this it is nothing else but this followed by this followed by this but this one you already told me this one is same as this so this followed by this followed by this is same as this followed by this followed by this okay so then this one is the other way around so this followed by this this path is therefore same as this path and therefore this path is same as this path so you see the pink one makes the outer two squares commute and similarly the other side so therefore this composite must be for the composites on the two extremities this composite must be the required one and hence i must have an equation like this Okay, I gave a very, very quick schematic proof of this, but it's up to you, you have to write it down, but you see the, the power of this, uh, of these diagrams, how it's, how it speaks for itself. So you have just pasted, you have, it's kind of these these compositions are allowing you to paste the top top diagram and the bottom diagram to get the outer diagram so it, you are using some kind of a pasting well i will not uh, elaborate any formally on this but you can get the idea that you are pasting these two diagrams and then you can use it and use it in your Essentially what you are doing is nothing else but, uh, but equations, equations, equations and equations. So, okay, let me, let me, let me, mm, so suppose, what is it, DE, uh, is it DE, oh, A to C, uh, B to D. B, this is D and this is E and F. So let's see. So this is your uh, F, G, ah, sorry, F, G, and this is your H and K. So this is your A, B, E, C, D, and F. So now let's see. So this one is the one that I'm bothered about. Okay. So let's let's try it out. H composed F. So I indicated to you the. So this is this one, which is the pink one. Uh, no, no, no. No, sorry, sorry, I have to show this. I have to show this. So I what I'm doing is, so this pink one is actually this. So let me actually put this in a separate color. Uh, yes, so this is, this pink one is this. So let's see. H composed K composed F comp cross G. So this is this. So let's see, PE composed this. Well, this is, see, see, the same thing that I told you by putting this, this path is same as this path and so on. That's what I'm doing. See, this is composition. It is associative. So this is this. 
composed f cross g. So you see, that's that equation which says that you can change this path. But this path is same as h composed pb composed f cross g, which is this, this, this. Now, again associativity, h composed pb f cross g, so which is this, again, by associativity. But this, you know, is h composed f composed pa, which again by associativity is this. So, the paths that I was drawing, this is same as this, is same as this, it is same as this. So, you see, these are nothing else but these equations. Okay? So, nothing else but these equations. And what have you done over here? You have used the property of these red unique lines and associativity of composition. That's it. Okay? Am I clear? Yes, you are, Doc. Any questions? Questions? Any questions? questions aside though. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I have done it differently but I didn't follow the method of using the diagram. Maybe I went it the wrong way. No, no, no. What I've done, I just... It may not be that you did it wrong. It may be you used the computation. What did you do? Yes, I used that. I said H cross K composed with F cross G into XY. Correct. Yes. And then, and then you get to and say H compose uh, H cross Y in brackets F of X G of X and then H of F of X cross K of G of Y. Yes. And then I said H compose with F X cross K composed with G Y, and then I end up with H composed with F cross K composed with G X Y, and I said the two are equal. So you did this, then you said, well, this is nothing else but H of F of A, K of G of C. So this is H cross K of F of A G of C. So this is H cross K of F cross G of A C. And hence this is H cross K composed F cross G, obviously. You did this, right? Yes, I did that. Yes, it's, it's perfectly all right. It's not wrong. It's not at all wrong. It's perfectly all right. But you see the difference between these two approaches. Here, you are actually computing at every step and yes, you got the correct answer. On the other hand, what I did over here was I utilized this diagram, this, this, this property. Well, what is that property? It, say, it is this basic property over here which says whenever I have this diagram printed in black, then there is only one way in which I can fill this from A cross C to B cross D by the function such that 
this whole diagram commutes, right? That is what I did. I just use this property. You see, there are there are two ways of describing things. Uh, uh, there are two ways uh, and uh, uh, well, this is a kind of poetic one. What I am going to say is uh, uh, obviously uh, I might be very weak because uh, I am going into an arena where I am not quite very strong but often you will see this is uh, well, you can describe a beautiful scenery by saying, well, there is a tree, there is a landscape, there is a such and such things you describe, all of it which is there side by side. That's one way of saying it. And the other way of saying it is possibly adding a few imageries uh, uh, to the fact that the it seems like the clouds are like uh, an umbrella over, over the blah, 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 whatever, right? So you use imageries to describe things. So what does the imageries do? Images, imageries take the properties of images and impose it to that place, right? So you are describing the same thing one by exactly saying what is where and in what relation and what, what, what's on. That's what you did in this case. So, you are exactly saying, stipulating what this function does. What is its domain, what is its codomain and what its function does and at each step you stipulate it and you get, well, that is one way to do it. The other way is, well, you have described the beautiful property of this function which you are utilizing in this argument, in this diagram argument. Okay? So there are two ways to do this. And uh, How do I say this? No, both of them are right. Both of them are correct. Both of them are logically perfect. Okay? But, well, proponents of one of them will say this is much better. Uh, people who like poetry will, li will say that this imagery is better than to say it uh, openly and crudely and people who don't like such imageries like things to be spelt out in proper terms would say well that one the other one is better I don't understand this imagery so <coughs> anyone is better but you will see as we go on down this course you will see that I am utilizing again and again this this imagery root this property root and it saves us a lot of energy it seems well that is how i feel it it doesn't say that the other side is wrong there is equally authentic other side also okay uh, so, that's what I would say. So, Stanley, what you said was right. It is not wrong, but you did it in another way. Uh, any further issues? Yes? Uh, let's not bother. Uh, you might be bothered. Uh, that's what I was also thinking. Uh, you see, the amount of material that we are going to go through for this usable part is also quite good, quite big. So, uh, let's not rush 
let's not rush. Let's understand how, as much as we can. Uh, let's not rush. And the one minute. Hello, Teka. I'm fine, thanks. Can we talk a little bit later? I'm in with Matt 4835 students. Okay. Uh, shall I call you? Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. So, yeah. Next, any questions? The next one, please come with your questions. Yeah, yeah last week I asked about the, the joint union. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let's let's come to that. Now, let's first try to see some pictures. Venn diagrams, which are so familiar in sets. So what is the A union B? A union B, you will immediately shade this whole place and say, all right, I came in and told you, well, we are not going to put in any diagrams, but we are going to have formulas. And this was replaced by this. Okay. And the way we understood our sets it told us that there is no repetition, right? So, an element over here appears in this A union B exactly once, right? Clear? Is it clear? Yes, Doc. Yes, Doc. It appears exactly once. So, in other words, so now let's see, what are we doing? We have just, uh, so, uh, ideally speaking, with the imagery that we started off with, uh, it as a, as a bag, we are just taking the elements out of the bag A and putting it inside a bigger bag called A union B. And once we get hold of the bag A union B, we cannot any further recognize whether this element was only in A or only in B or in both. We can only recognize whether it comes from A or whether it comes from B. Because that's what it is telling us. It could have come from both. But we are not counting it twice. So what, what if we want to, we want to also know, we want to know that to each element, we want to know, we want to tag it by saying, oh, this element came from A. In that case, the common elements would be taken twice. Because once it will come in, because it was an element of A, and another time it will come in because it has come in as an element of B. Okay? So it will come in twice. So, how to do that? So that means I need to tag it. That means... See, I, this is an intuitive way of thinking. So how do I tag it? Well, let us say that we put a tag of 1 for elements of A 
and tag of 2 for elements of B. So how do I tag an element? Well, the best way to tag by what we have learned is by considering the ordered pair. So whenever I see some element like this, I know this x is actually coming from A. And whenever I see something like this, I know this x prime is coming from B. So I now collect these tagged elements. So if I write it now, it looks like this. Okay, so this set, what essentially have we done? The same element x, this p, this p comes in now once as p1 and once as p2. So by tagging it, we have actually kind of disjointified this set. So as if, as if we have replaced this set, as if we have replaced this set by a copy of it. Oops, sorry. Everything didn't come up all by a copy of it. Uh, let me put by a copy of it here and this set by another copy of it. Say this. And then taken their union. So now this one is no more looking like this, but this looks like this, and this looks like this. So we have disjointified them. So we have made them disjoint. and then taken the union. And that's why this is called the disjoint union. So that's why it is called the disjoint union. So there are two processes over here. The first process is disjointifying the sets. So here you see, so if we have any two sets, so it's a principle. If you have any two sets, it is, if they are disjoint, they are already disjoint. There is nothing to do with it. If they are not, we can disjointify them without losing any information about it. So how do we disjointify it? As I said, you just take the Cartesian product of one tag, which is 1 in this case, and the other tag is 2. So you just take this Cartesian product. So if there are 3, 4, 5, you know how to disjointify those sets. Okay. So that's, that's the first process, disjointifying a given collection of sets. And then, and then take the union. That's the disjoint union. Okay, and it is called the coproduct. It is another name for this is also coproduct. And why it is called the coproduct?
The reason is this. So, I started with this A and here is this disjoint sum. Now I can define these functions. Did I write it as iota A? Yes. So what does this do? Well this one takes x and just adds its tag. And this one takes a y and adds the tag for y. Okay? Now suppose if you have any set T and you have two functions. Okay? Then I am saying that you can fill this up in a unique way. And can you tell me what would, what should be, what do you think should be the most natural thing to do? Because in the disjoint union, if you look into this imagery, there are only two kinds of points in A plus B. There are only two kinds of points. Either it has a tag 1 or it has a tag 2. Tag 1 means it is coming from A. Tag 2 means it is coming from B. So, what should you do? What should... See something U from A plus B. So, you know U obviously is either of this kind or of this kind. So what should F u be? Can you define? Can you tell me what should be the formula then? Anyone? Would it be the F um, cross F, sorry, composite I A? Yes, yes, yes. So that means if u is of this form, then what should it be? Composite function. Yes, so what, what should be the value? It should if be I of x, right? Okay. Because then it is coming from here. Or, otherwise, the only other possibility is this. Then it should be. So we often write this function in this. So we call these piecewise defined functions. So this is f a of x. If it is this. Or f b of x prime. Oops. Hello? Hi, I'm your class at Cheek. Class at Port Phone Call. Who is it? No, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Shari Atta Shumai Phone Call. Cheek. Cheek. So, it will be this or this. So, that's, that's the obvious thing to do. Because A plus B has only two types of elements. And if it, are, if it is of, of the first kind, that's, that's the way. And you, you see, this therefore again is the unique function. Why? And what, so, what, what, so it's unique with respect to what? It's not, I'm not saying there exists only one function from A plus B to T. I'm saying it's a unique function such that F composed iota A is F A and F composed iota B is F B. 
which satisfies these two conditions. Okay, so that is, so this function is unique with respect to these two equations. And why is it unique with respect to these equations? If h was another one, again, if h was another one, then it turns out that since A plus B has only two types of elements, then H of X1 is nothing else but FA of X and H of X2 is FB of X so that h is equal to n. So that's the unique one. Okay? So now, this actually is trying to say why it is co-product. It's a very strange thing. Let's draw these two diagrams side by side. So the first diagram we had was this product. And the second diagram that we have is this. Here I also wrote this as if. So, as if the transformation is that, well, this, everything was as if kept same except this one, this cross changes to plus and the direction of each of these arrows somehow get reversed. Right? And the people involved with diagrams, they call this the product diagram. And the people involved with diagrams call this the co-product diagram. Co means to suggest that as if in the product diagram you just reverse the arrows and you get it. And then if that is the case, if just by reversing arrows you get it, then all the logic that followed in a diagrammatic proof will also go through over here. And therefore, therefore, see, now I'll be a little bit fast, but try to stop me. So therefore, if I have a diagram like this, Ah, this was drawn in black, uh, in blue. 
So then there will be a unique way to go from here to here. Now let me copy. So that's the analog of 50. Then the analog of the other one would be well in case when these were identities. So see, diagram people will not draw that arrow and say call it the identity. They will draw it like this to say that it is an identity then this one must also be the identity. And then there will be, so you, you can paste it obviously. Um, If you can do this, then you can do this. So this one will give you a description of a function like f plus g. This one will tell you something like this. This one will tell you h plus h plus uh, k composed f plus g would be h composed f plus k composed g okay see the same logic should appear it is nothing else but just by changing the direction of the arrows. You told me there was this unique one. And this is also equality. So I should say, yeah, I draw do drew, drew, drew the equality here. Sorry. Okay. And then over here also this is equality. See? The same logic should follow. The same and you did not do it twice. So if you have done for this. This should evidently follow because this came from here following the diagram logic. The same diagram logic from this logic, this one flowed and this one flowed. So this comes from here using the diagram logic and the rest follows. So if one follows, if one string of arguments follow, then just by reversing the direction of the diagram arrows, there should be another notion and that thing should also follow. So your work is now halved. You just observe one, then you know what is the other thing. That's number one. And you can immediately now relate these two very, very dis disparate things. One is the Cartesian product. And another is this disjoint union. 
in a very strange way. It's a very strange way though. Uh, it has no meaning. You see, meaning is something which comes up on, on <coughs> repeated application of certain rituals. You see? So, this immediate, uh, this immediate reversal of arrows had no meaning. But suddenly when you saw that this diagram gave rise to this diagram, which is F cross G, and this diagram gave rise therefore to this diagram, to this logic. And similarly over here, you obtained this H cross K composed F cross G is H composed F cross K composed G. When you had this, okay, then you immediately concluded by the way you proceeded using the logic of the diagram which in a sense is nothing else but you using the properties of this unique f which makes this diagram to commute so that gives rise to this and the same logic permeated in all these so therefore since it is defined by the same technique the same principle should apply all the equations are very different Okay, and what turns up on real life, on real situations, the things are completely different. But you see, there is a pattern in the way you are arguing. And once you come to this stage, after you have done this, this analogy should tell you, ah, the thing about reversal of arrows has some kind of a meaning. We don't know what till yet. It has some kind of a meaning. It at least halves our efforts. If you did not do this, well, as Stanley did before, he was right. He would have, he would have taken a point and then done the calculation and the same calculations over here have to be done to do this and you will get the results there is no there is no uh, there is no question about it but this new uh, dimension that i am adding once you take it away the rest becomes very very computationally involved and the insight into this into this way of deduction somehow vanishes so that's why i give a lot of importance on these diagrams uh, so and that is what is essentially told in five section number five and number six um, uh, number five essentially number five yes number five um, questions, your comments. Yes, am I alone? Sorry, doctor. No, no. Yeah. Um, you're referring to number five and number six. Number six, I haven't till yet. Number six is, uh, I'll, I'll say it now. If, if, if you have not yet got, got it. If you have understood it, then it's fine. Yeah, I think it's clear. The only problem I, I had on the disjoint unions, I think we have already explained it, especially that, that issue of, uh, what did you call it, by petting them? Disjointifying it. Yes, disjointifying them. Yes. yes. So I was not so sure where the ones and twos were coming from. But you have explained it clearly well. 
thank you for this join how should you spell it i don't know uh, people write both ways this jointify okay well it is not an english word it has been made in, into the mathematical dictionary yeah the issue was which was a problem also was that of taking oh. i was not so sure where the ones and twos were coming from from the set that we you gave as an example there ah okay 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 that There's could no be one. there was a one in it also right yes Ah, okay, 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 yeah, uh, yes, 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 I see, okay, then how do you suggest I should, uh, ah, okay, but putting in all of this once that comes in as a tag, I said over here, uh, brings along with a lot of uh, non mathematical uh, things whether it should be in the notes or i have uh, it is something i think which uh, which remains for explanation uh, and you you're right we could be it could be sensed as what is this one and what is this two okay but now it is clear right clear um, but 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 still on that example there yeah uh we have got five we have got four one yes and four two yes and seemingly five is only taken with one it is also not taken with two no it cannot be tagged with 2 because 5 doesn't belong to b okay yeah i get it it's not that everything is going to be tagged tag is saying from which one is it coming so since i have 5 1 it tells me it is from a but since i do not have 5 2 it tells me 5 was not in b Yeah. Okay. But four, since it is in both, it comes once as four one and another time as four two. Okay. It's clear now. Though. Okay. Okay. Now, the next one, number six, is it clear? Number six. The, the, the empty set is always a challenge. Yes, it is. It is. And the challenge whenever... So, it is not actually the empty set which poses the challenge. It is the way we treat with uh, these uh, statements. You are seeing again and again from the beginning that I am, it is kind of getting apparent to you that somehow I am throwing away pictures and I am putting a lot of stress in, form, in, in formulas and manipulation of formulas and it will become very very clear why. Because mathematics is essentially is nothing else but it's very syntactic it's nothing else but certain well-formed formulas and mathematical manipulations and how do you do these mathematical manipulations you do via logical uh, logical uh, way what is the logical way so you move from one statement to another statement via equivalence so your proofs are something like this you have a statement which you if which I which I'm writing as alpha 
then you have something like this, then you have something like this, and then after some finitely many stage, you tell me that I have obtained T, a tau. So, if it is like this, then you say alpha implies tau. Okay? So, it is always things like this that I am giving much more stress. That's number one. Now, how do we calculate this? Till now, we are doing it by something called truth tables. Now, in the truth table for and is quite acceptable. Nobody will question it that P and Q is false only when both of them are false. P or Q is false, uh, sorry, P and Q is false when either one of them is false. P or Q is false when both of them are false. The problem is with P implies Q. P implies Q, this statement is false if and only if P is true and Q is false. Now There is obviously a question, why? Why? Why do I take this? So therefore, this, uh, before coming to that, let's say, therefore we agree to say that this is true, this is true in all the other cases, in our other cases. So that gives rise to this vacuous set of implications. What is the vacuous set? That is, when P is false, then irrespective of what Q is, the statement P implies Q is still true. And this gives rise to an alarming amount of uh, surprises in mathematics because there are only two kinds of statements and definitions in mathematics. One is definitive it is just like saying this is it it says this is this so like reflexive so it's an assertive statement for every x x x must be related x must be related to itself it is an assertive statement and the other kind is an implicative statement and implicative the moment you have an implicative statement there is a problem and what is the problem? The problem is of vacuous implication. What happens if the hypothesis is false? Then it is true. Then what does it mean? So whenever you see a definition from now on, having this implication in it, start looking into the surprises that come from vacuousness. Vacuousness is going to give you surprises and this is exactly what I told you in number 6. Okay? I still leave it to you to read it, understand it and then be... If you have further problems then we will come to it. Vacuous implication is one of the real uh, surprising places. It is the, it is the, what do you say? It is the powerhouse of surprise. So, be careful. And uh, just as an aside, just as an aside, uh, this is a, the, uh, it would be nice if you would, uh, well, this, this way of looking into truth and falsity uh, is quite opposed to what 
uh, people in other places uh, look at and uh, I often say that truth in its essence is only studied in mathematics. In other places it is not truth, it is not proof, it is completely something else. It is evidence, evidence and evidence. Evidence and and satisfaction or, or, or uh, truth means uh, uh, a, a happening, uh, an occurrence. Truth is an occurrence and in proof is evidence. Uh, it would be, uh, I have forgotten the name, but it would be something like this. Uh, if in your uh, free time you can go through, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a demanding book, obviously because it deals with such topics, on truth, proof and evidence. Uh, and you will see that in most places in science, in well, economics is also one kind of science, social sciences is also some kind of science. So science, unlike, well, I'm an Indian, so by my culture anything is science, any inquiry is science, uh, which completely differs from the West and especially the British understanding of science. However, any inquiry is science and why do I say so? Because every inquiry is based on first some postulates and then you have some happenings, some events, some occurrences and then you build up a kind, you theorize, well this is possibly going to happen and then you wait and wait until such things happen. If it happens, well, your theory is right. If it doesn't, then your theory is wrong and you start to remodel, re revamp your theory into another one. And that's what every kind of inquiry is about. Uh, it, the, the, the sample space, the, the, the objects of study might be different in physics. Uh, in electromagnetics, you study certain certain waves, uh, certain kinds of waves. In particle theory you study particles. Uh, in economic sciences you have other kinds of objects to study. In social sciences you have another kind of objects to study, but essentially the method is this. But in mathematics it's completely different. The first time we start entering, we say that truth is a value. I don't know what is truth. Truth is a value given to statements. And falsity is another value. So I have only two values, zero and one. And how do I manipulate with them? Well, it is in the manipulation of the statements. So that's how everything comes up in the manipulation of statements. And then comes several... Uh, kinds of logic, when we take to Boolean classical logic, is this what we are doing. There are other mathematics possible when you change the logic and sometimes the, the, the conclusions can be vitally different. Sometimes they are same but sometimes the conclusions can be terribly different and some, some sometimes which are also in this Boolean classical logic, might turn out to be true in other places. So, uh, doing this, only mathematics shows that there is nothing called an absolute truth of a statement, an absolute falsity of a statement. It all depends on how you put the valuation. And when you start to take this, uh, they take this stance, which is, in stark difference with what is done in science, by the way, then you have to make your methods reliable only on certain syntactic manipulations along these lines of logic. 
otherwise you are going to land up in problems. So that's why mathematics is mostly considered as a syntactic manipulation of formulas. The imageries, the, the, the pictures are what comes up in continuous usage and reusage and further usage of rituals. A big example is here. The blues are just reversal of arrows of the blacks. But you see, the black arrows, that, row, that column gave rise to a certain kind of a logic. And then suddenly you see that same logic applies to reversal of arrows. So reversal of arrows at the end of this page, and the beginning of this page was nonsense, at the end of this page seems to have a meaning. And as we go throughout this course, you will see how quickly and I am utilizing this reversal of arrows, how much I am utilizing this, and so it will give a meaning. And it has a meaning. So, meaning comes up from continuous uh, repetitive usage of rituals. And rituals are syntactic manipulations of formulas. So, that's a completely different stance and you have to take it if you have to do mathematics. So, I said all of this because 6, as you said, yes, empty set is a problem. No, it is not the empty set which is a problem. It is the way we are taking our logic to be. We have taken the simplest logic, Boolean classical logic, and that's it's, it's, it's embedded in that logic itself. So that vacuousness of implication is the problem, not elsewhere. Okay? So whenever you have an implication statement, be careful, it is a powerhouse of surprise. You are going to have this kind of uh, sudden bouncers coming up. And if you see why, well, implication. Reason, implication. Okay? So, I will not uh, go uh, with number six any further because I want you to go through it, understand it properly in the light of this implication statement. The function, remember, the notion of a function has three has three components. First, function from A to B. First, it's a relation. Two, it says X belongs to X. Uh, sorry, X belongs to A implies. Ah, you see this implication comes up. And three, x y and x y prime belongs to f. This comma means and means x y belongs to f and x y prime belongs to f implies. So these three statements are true. It means it is a function. So, given this, and remember, one is also an implication statement, but it looks simplified in the, in, the, in the guise of that subset symbol. But remember, subset is also an implication, and that is where the empty set comes in. The empty set, you know, the subset of every set, that's where, <coughs> that's where that thing is already taken care of and that's why it looks so beautiful with that rounded uh, less than kind of a symbol, the subset symbol. Uh, we have already taken care of that. But 2 and 3 is still bare and that's where our issue in 6 comes up. Okay. Alright. 
questions comments yeah What is it? I'm saying I'm fine. Aha. Uh -huh. Others? Charles? E e everything is fine, Doc, now. Mavutu? I think we just, we just have to go through whatever you have said and then maybe. Yeah. Should there anything of interest arises, then maybe we'll bring it to the next lesson. Yes, please. Yes. So. Yeah, oh, everything is fine, Doc. Okay, Mavutu, yeah? Are yes, um, I'm okay, doctor. Okay. It's fine. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I would actually, okay, okay. Are you also, you said yes, fine, I, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Let's, let's do it slowly. But once we, you will see after some time, we can go a little faster. Even if you are slow in the beginning, it doesn't matter. But let us understand and then we shall proceed, okay? So let's not hurry. It's not, uh, uh, we, we don't have to catch a train. Uh, so uh, it, uh, let's not hurry. That's the first thing. And I would actually insist, uh, well, 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 uh, I know you might be otherwise uh, more involved. Uh, but I would actually insist in, in you trying to do this extra reading, go through this book on truth, proof and evidence. And you will see it's, a, it's, a, it's an eye-opener. It's an eye-opener kind of a book because our education seems to veil us and tells us that something is science, something is humanities and blah, blah, blah. And uh, that's one side of this issue. And it tells us this is scientific evidence and therefore this is true. But, and we tend to make our beliefs and our lives and our everything, uh, uh, everything dependent on that vague notion of being true and being truthful. But what the hell is this true? So, and this book actually speaks about it. And what the hell is this proof? And you'd be astonished to see that, well, beyond mathematics, uh, there is very little place. Uh, I shouldn't say a very little place. But the places that I will say will obviously uh, strike you. Mathematics, music and art, fine arts, they are very, very similar. But beyond this, nowhere do people speak about truth. They speak about occurrence, events. Nowhere do they speak about truth. Yes? Are you? No. Did you say something? No, I didn't. I'm listening carefully. Ah, nowhere they speak about truth. They speak about occurrence and event. Nowhere they speak about proof. They speak about evidence. And the two are starkingly different. Starkingly different. Uh, uh, very, very different. So evidence is one thing, it suggests on the basis of evidence some facts may turn out to be right. And we all know this. <clears throat> For instance, uh, Newtonian, Newtonian physics never told us that, always told us light travels in a straight line. But Einsteinian Relativity theory tells us no light also bends and gravity bends it and well there was no evidence in the time of Newton. 
Einstein's theory would have fallen flat on the ground if Michelson Morley experiment didn't happen. Michelson Morley experiment changed the viewpoint of the earth, or of the physicists and viewpoint of uh, scientists to show that yes, it does bend. Light doesn't always travel in a straight line. So, so you see evidence. So in science, it's not truth. It's not proof. It's evidence. So evidence changes the validity of a statement. But mathematical truth is something different. So you could have listened, heard this uh, from everyone, even in your schoolmasters or uh, others say, some of three angles of a triangle is true on this earth, is true on, uh, on Pluto, is true everywhere and anywhere. No, no, no. The, the fact that he wanted to say is, if we assume the postulates of Euclid, then the sum of three triangles, angles of a triangle, is one it is two right angles. But if we don't, there are geometries where some of three angles of a triangle is greater than two right angles and there are geometries where it is lesser than two right angles. All three cases are true. So the question is if, if we assume the postulates of Euclidean geometry then wherever and we are and we obviously make the assumption that we are using using boolean classical logic in our deduction scheme that we never say but if we assume the postulates of euclid and take the boolean classical logic as our deduction scheme then sum of three angles of a triangle is always equal to two right angles wherever you are however, wherever you are. This is truth. So, this is, this is true. You see, this is one thing, one kind of a statement. And another kind of a statement is that, well, if you are in this kind of an universe uh, as you are now uh, in this usual framework in your reference frame, then light moves in a straight line. But if you are in a bigger, if you consider yourself in a bigger uh, cosmos, uh, in, a, in, a, in, the, in, a, in a larger space, where you yourself become a point so small, where gravity now becomes observable, then you can see that light paints. Huh? So, this kind of truth is one and the Euclidean one which I said is another one. So, you see the difference. One is dependent, one is an occurrence, evidence and another is logical deduction. Huh? So, the two are different. So it would be nice, in, uh, nice if you could uh, read this, and yes, we can have debates on that also. Uh, that would be quite enlightening. But uh, yes, uh, read it. Yeah, I stop here. Okay, doc. Before you go, who's the author of the book? Ah, I think it is Lakatos. Uh, Imre Lakatos, if I remember well, uh, he is a philosopher in mathematical philosophy. Imre Lakatos. I read this, this, this in when I was still in India. It was a uh, Dover publication, small. Uh, quarto size book but very thick yes it uh, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is a strange book to be published in that form. I mean to say in that quarto size form, usually the books were never more than 100 or 200 pages, but this is almost uh, a little more thicker. But, uh, it, uh, yeah, I remember it was a blue cover, Imre Lakatos, uh, proof, truth, proof and evidence. Uh, yeah, uh, if I can find its references much easier, uh, I will, uh, more, more to it, I will I'll send it via an email. Yeah. Imre Lakatos, he is a, he is from this Czechoslovakian uh, country, Czechoslovakia, the country possibly is no more. It has been merged with others to be something. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's an old book. It's an old book. Uh, it will be there somewhere. But uh, let me see. If I can find any more reference, I'll, I'll do it. Hmm. I don't remember now this, uh, there were two things, Estonia, Czechoslovakia, near about, near about that place there was a lot of reshuffling and in which the new countries are now formed. In earlier days it was not like this. Uh, okay, I, I, I'll send the reference. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Doc. Thank you. Thanks, then we uh, join next time. Uh, in the meantime, uh, well, this worked today, it was fine. Should we wait? Uh, should we wait until this uh, platform really breaks down or should we try something else? This platform mean I, I so mean. Far it's working for me. Yeah, it is working, but sometimes it breaks. Uh, it's working for me also, but sometimes it was uh, and quite frequent. Frequently, it was breaking. So in other groups, we changed it. Okay, let's keep it till we really fumble upon. Yeah. Okay. So next time we meet here. Again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doc. Thank you. Keep well. Thank you, Dr. Barsa. Thank you.